the Computer History Museum has been around uh, originally as the Computer Museum in uh, Boston uh, since the 1980s. And we've been here in Mountain View, California since the uh, mid-90s. And we've opened in this wonderful facility uh, back about 2000. Uh, in January of this year, we opened our new exhibit, which is 25,000 square feet, dedicated to revolutions, the first 2,000 years of computing. And so we cover uh, about 20 different areas, ranging from uh, the birth of the computer, punch cards, calculators, mainframes, uh, all the way up through PCs, games. You know, so it's a huge exhibit that goes through all the eras of computing. This is the IBM PC, the machine that really started the PC revolution. Um, before the P IBM PC, there were personal computers like the Apple II, uh, the Altair, all of those. But really it was the PC that led to businesses taking the computer uh, that wasn't a giant mainframe seriously. And this machine led to the clone revolution of the 1980s. And one of the great things about the PC was that they did open up the architecture after they kind of had to. Um, because of the uh, wonderful uh, reverse engineering and clean room work that has done, been done by a lot of groups to make their own phones. And this came out in 1981, and by 1983, a number of other machines had started to copy the BIOS and so forth, and that changed the entire game of personal computing. So what you see here is our, our wall of clones. And uh, some of the first clones that were done uh, actually weren't of the IBM PC. There was the, uh, the Apple II, like the, uh, the Franklin, Franklin H100 right there. Uh, also very popular in the Eastern Bloc countries uh, was the Sinclair ZX80, which uh, the Soviet Union and East Germany did dozens of different variations of. But it was really with the, uh, the IBM PC and the PC architecture that really led to companies like Eagle and Compact especially was the company that really launched the world of clones and the phrase IBM compatible was hugely important. And another, the Columbia PC, another very early, um, arguably the first PC clone, didn't sell particularly well because people really didn't understand the clone concept really until uh, Compaq came and just blew everything out of the water. But between Eagle and Columbia and Compaq, really the three major companies that sort of started the clone revolution that led to uh, MS-DOS and Windows really exploded. And what eventually happened was that uh, Compaq beat IBM to the punch to doing the first uh, 386 base, uh, the Guest Pro 386, and there was no uh, IBM at all uh, version Pro 386 at that point. So, you know, the student had become the master. Uh, you know, incredible to see this little company that had grown up in Texas actually beating IBM to market. And that really changed the entire view of the PC world and actually made the clone makers the leader. One of the major influences uh, that led to sort of the PC revolution were the homebrew movement. And so there were a number of companies that started popping up as soon as the microprocessor became available. And the most famous of them is this one here, the Altair 8800. And it has a very interesting tie to uh, the PC because a company was founded to provide uh, the basic programming language for the Altair. And this dude named Paul Allen and another one named Bill Gates uh, came up with this paper tape for Altair Basic. And that was really the launch of Microsoft. So this is where they sort of started. And one of their prime business areas for a number of years was providing programming languages to early uh, personal computers like the, the Altair uh, and the ones that were compatible with it like the, uh, the Inside and also to the Apple II. So it was really one of their, that was where sort of the thing started. And Microsoft very early on recognized that they needed to get uh, into different markets, onto different platforms and machines. So the, the microprocessor was invented in about 1971, 7071, and, but it really became cheap enough and available to the public uh, starting about 1974. So you have most of your machines like the, uh, the Altair is 1975, uh, the Inside 76, 77, the Apple II 1977. Uh, you had sort of three machines that all released in 1977. Uh, the Apple II, the Com Commodore Pet, and the TRX-80, which all were sort of game changers because they were inexpensive and they were whole. You didn't have to have any particular knowledge 
to be able to use them. You could actually just, you know, run software. And it started with this software company saying, oh, look, it's not just specialists who are probably going to go out and write their own software. There's also uh, individuals who just want to run off-the-shelf software. And so that was sort of your starting point was in 77 with these three big machines. What I consider the biggest business blunder in history was this little tiny Japanese calculator company owned the right to the microprocessor until something like 1972 or 73 and sold it to Intel, who had developed it for $50,000. And what happened was, as they started to develop it, the prices dropped and the capabilities grew. And with the price drops, it led hobbyists who had started working in the late 60s, but mostly the early 70s with bringing computers uh, down to a more personal level. And that's what really led to people adopting the microprocessor. In fact, there's a machine here, I'll show you, called, it's a Belleville PC. And Bob Belleville had worked with the Xerox Alta, one of the very first uh, workstations, the first machine to have a graphical user interface, for example. And he decided to try to build one based around an Intel 8080 processor. And that was relatively cheap. It was very easy to use. There was a huge amount of documentation on it. And to be a computer guy in the early 70s uh, working at, on microprocessors, you had to have great knowledge and be able to do everything yourself. But it gave you so much freedom. So we actually have a, uh, an audio processor built into here. Um, not shown here, but we actually made a scanner and a printer. Uh, so, you know, guys with all these great enthusiasm and, you know, a little bit of technology and less extra cash, and you could build your own machine completely from scratch. And so, you know, over here you see a number of other machines that were from this era. And you had to be good with a soldering iron. You had to know what you were doing. Just like the Homebrew Computer Club gave us Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, Adam Osborne, Lee Felsenstein, so that first generation of personal computer superstars and heavyweights. You don't see a lot of bits that were conceived for these machines in modern PCs, but what you do see is the personnel who worked on these and delivered them continue to have an influence. One of the great examples I have is that for years and years. Steve Wozniak's influence on computing, for example, he did the Apple I, very significant machine for early hobbyists. He did the Apple II, an incredibly important machine for acceptance of computers by schools, uh, in the home, uh, for gameplay, really helped to launch his software industry. But beyond that, his influence is really there. His real influence is that he led people to taking computers seriously and to introducing them into the home. And that alone makes him more important than anyone I could think of with the possible exception of Linux Thorvald.